dramatic interludes. Ooh. Now, as many of you are no doubt already aware, our own Mr. Charles Dickens was full halfway through the completion of the greatest mystery novel of our time when he committed that one ungenerous deed of his noble career. He died, leaving behind not the slightest hint as to the outcome of his bizarre and incomplete puzzle, the mystery of Edwin Drood. And so, ladies and gentlemen, when we reach that point in our story in which Mr. Charles Dickens wrote no more, I shall be asking you to vote upon key questions regarding the outcome of our plot. Our company will then make its most earnest effort to contrive an ending in accordance with your specifications. So come on now, let's all be as vulgar and uncivilized as is humanly possible. <laughs> Kick off your boots, loosen your corsets, and enjoy yourselves. Oh, and for those gentlemen among you who arrived alone and required companionship up through the final curtain, or beyond, you need only to speak to our stage manager, Miss Joyce Throttle, whose pleasure it is to see that. You need never be lonely again. I will fix you up later, sir. Oh, look, Joyce, he's so excited, his tongue's nearly hanging. Oh, just kidding, he's wearing a pink tie. But do remember, gentlemen, these sparkling and vivacious ingenues are not salaried employees of the music hall, so we do ask you to contribute generously towards their theatrical studies, and that all goods are returned tomorrow morning. None the worse for wear. Thank you. So let us proceed with this evening's bill of fare. The, for the first time ever, the complete musical rendition of The Mystery of Edwin Drew. Cloisterham, 
the ancient Muldron Cathedral city of Cloisterham. Not a particularly encouraging setting for the Christmas season now upon us. A wintry shudder blows through the giant elms as they shed a gush of tears. And here we are in the home of Mr. John Jasper, choir master of Cloisterham Cathedral. Choir master, composer, organist, and vocal instructor, John Jasper is blessed with the voice the angels themselves might envy. And who better to essay the role than that gifted vocalist himself, your very own Mr. Clive Paget. John Jasper eagerly awaits the arrival of his nephew and the title character of our evening's diversion, young Edmund Drood. Hello, Uncle. Why, there's the lad now. My dear Uncle. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, your eyes do not deceive you. Devotees of the male impersonation are more used to seeing Miss Nodding in top hat and tails when she does her inimitable rendition of Aren't I Half a Toff? Tonight she hides her distinct form beneath the garb of young Edmund Drood. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, if you will, for the music hall's guest artiste and London's leading male impersonator, Miss Alice Nutting. I need dinner, Uncle. You forget, Ned, that uncle and nephew are words here prohibited by thus express agreements. Of course you're right, Jack. After all, we do only have half a dozen years or so between our ages. Hello, Jack, don't drink yet. I must propose a toast. A toast to what, Ned? He asks, to what? To Rosa. Rosa. To the fair Miss Rosa Bud. Surely you have not forgotten that Rosa and I are soon to be wed. It has not quite slipped my mind. Ah, yes, a tedious ceremony in your creaking cathedral, John. And then off with my wonderfully pretty child bride to dusty Egypt, where I do intend to shake things up a bit. It is Egypt, then. It seems a very desperate great distance. Indeed it is. This portrait of Rosa is not one of my better efforts, Jack, yet you choose to hang it here. In heaven's name, why? Because it reminds me of it. You, Ned, and the happiness I wish you in Rosa. Oh, I'm sure we'll be quite happy. But what courtship suffers from an unavoidable flatness, owing to the fact that my dead and gone father and her dead and gone father had a good and married us at birth? Why in the devil couldn't they have left us alone? Tut tut, dear boy. Tut tut? Yes, it's all very well for you, Jack. You have the freedom to love whomsoever you choose. No, don't stop. Do go on. Have I hurt your feelings, John? How could you have hurt my feelings? Good heavens, Jack, you look frightfully ill. There's a strange film come over your eyes. I've been taking medicine for a pain, an agony, an agony that overcomes me. I've been forced by Lake to seek a treatment in London. Fear not, the effects will soon be gone. My dear. <laughs> Take it as a warning, and Ned. Edward, this is a confidence between us. It shall be so sacredly preserved. I have confided in you because... Because we are fast friends, and because you love and trust me as I love and trust you. Both hands, Jack. My dearest Uncle Jack. My dearest nephew Ned. A life without your friendship would be like this good as dead. Ah, the winds of hell may blow, but as you well may know, I'll heed your call who need to small and face the fire below. For you, for you, two kinsmen more than brothers, we know no next of kin, and yet we know no one is close beneath the skin. The blood that flows between us, the bonds that tie us twain. Two kingsmen, when all others leave and we remain. My dearest nephew Ned. My dearest Uncle Jack. If men said a word against you, I would make them take them back. Why are we in mind? Would it be so glad to die? If for my death one extra breath of life for you I'd buy. Tis true. Tis true. More than brothers, we know no next of kin, and yes, we know no others close beneath the skin. The blood that flows between us, the bonds that tie us twain. Two kings men, when all others bleed, and we remain. Tis true, tis true, for you, two kings men, are we two? Clive Paget and Miss Alice Nothing, ladies and gentlemen. 
I trust the moderation of your applause merely means you're conserving your energies for the final curtain. But to continue our story, young Edwin Trude is visiting Cloisterham to offer his regards to his bride-to-be, the fair Miss Rosa Budd, who, like Trude, is an orphan. Miss Budd resides in Cloisterham's most respectable seminary for young ladies, aptly, if not correctly named, the Nun's House. Ladies and gentlemen, in the part of Rosa Bud this evening, I give you that most delicate of English roses, that blossoming bud who has yet to be plucked, your very own and beloved, Miss Deirdre Peregrine. Rosa, the happiest of birthdays to you. I only wish I may be able to say these words on each of your birthdays. I fear. I fear that is not likely, since, as you know, your own nephew Edwin and I will be departing for Egypt once we are married. It was only a wish, dearest Rosa. How beautiful you look! I have awaited your birthday with eagerness. Eagerness, Mr. Jasper? Yes. Your voice will no longer be subject to the fluctuations of adolescence. And in what condition is your voice today, my dear student? As my tutor. Perhaps that question should best be answered by you, Mr. Jasper. Shall I sing the Mozart? No. I have composed a symphony especially for you on the occasion of your birthday. A choir master's pay being what it is, my life's blood is all I can afford to offer. Sir, I... Mr. Jasper, I cannot sing these words. It would not be proper. Whatever do you mean? I cannot. I am not worthy of it. As your choir master, that should be my decision. From the beginning. Please. Lovely, Rosa. Thank you, sir. But lovely will not do! When you sing these words, you must make me feel you mean them. 
from the beginning. Please. She's not used to an audience. And besides, Mr. Jasper, you are such a conscientious master that I believe you make her afraid of you. No wonder. No wonder. I believe you'd be afraid of him under similar circumstances, wouldn't you, Miss Landless? Not under any circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, the unpredictable Miss Janet Connor. Good evening, Reverend Chris Sparkle. Good evening, Mr. Jasper, and allow me to introduce young Neville Landless. He and his twin sister, Helena, have crossed over from Ceylon, where they no longer have any family. Neville's been entrusted to my care, and Helena will be staying here at the nun's house. Welcome to Cloisterham, Mr. Landless. I believe young Neville's been given over to me to calm his rather hot-tempered nature, and to make a new beginning here at Cloisterham. You and your sister lost your parents recently. <laughs> Mr. Landis, their mother died when they were very young. So their stepfather has crossed over as well. I am most sorry. You bright gentlemen need not console me. It was very well my stepfather died when he did, or I might have killed him myself. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest member of our company, Mr. Victor Grinstead. I surprise you, sir. You, you shock me. Unspeakably shock me. You never saw him beat my sister. My stepfather was a brute, Mr. Jasper. In desperation, Helena tried on more than one occasion to flee our stepfather's cruel and miserly hand, even going so far as to disguise herself as a boy, but to no avail. As for myself, I have, from my earliest remembrances, had to conceal a deadly and bitter hatred, which has made me secretive and revengeful. But, I say, sir, your kindness and goodwill has moved me and I pledge to change my ill-tempered ways and break new ground for myself. There's the lad. He'll blend in soon enough, Mr. Jasper. <laughs> Mr. Jasper, your pupil, she sings beautifully. Thank you. I trust your efforts have not been without success? I trust so, Mr. Landis. And may I inquire if your relationship extends to beyond that of pupil and master? Oh, no, no. <clears throat> Miss Budd has been betrothed to young Edwin Drood, Mr. Jasper's nephew. You do well to cast your eyes and interests in other directions, sir. I beg your No pardon is necessary. However, I must be off. Choir practice, I fear. However, I wish you well in your new life, Mr. Landis. Thank you, Mr. Jasper. Thank you indeed. I trust we shall meet again. And I should like to meet this Drood. I'd like to see what sort of man is worthy of the affections of Miss Bob. Steady, lad. Steady. You are feeling better now, aren't you? Oh, much, thank you. These surroundings, which may seem very secure to you, are new and uncertain to me. You'll be my friend, won't you? I will be as good a friend as such a mite of a thing can be to such a womanly and handsome creature as you. Who is Mr. Jasper? My Edwin's uncle, and my music master. You know that he loves you. Oh, don't, don't! He terrifies me! I feel I am never safe from him! He has made a slave of me with his looks, forced me to keep silent without his uttering a single threat. Be careful. You're tearing Mr. 
Jasper's composition. It is of no matter. I do not intend to sing it again. Oh, I'm sure we'll have one more reprise of this before we're finished, don't you think? <laughs> but now we must step from the chaste sanctity of the nun's house and travel for reasons which will soon become clear, to the wickedest corner and the wickedest hole in the fabric of the city of London. Below the street and beneath contempt lies the opium den of the Princess Puffer. Here the universal tongue of opium is spoken, with its sub-dialects of prostitution burglary, violence for profit, and murder. And reigning supreme over this blemish on England's fair complexion lies the Princess Buffer, who ministrates to her client's needs and who hears more than she tells. Ladies and gentlemen, portrayed this evening by the Grand Dame of the Music Hall Royale, I give you that Queen Mother of the Red Light District and that good woman of ill repute, your very own and beloved, Miss Angela Prysock. <laughs> What I tells them, if it did, would I be here? Mixing pipes, what then I sells them for a pint of rotten beer? Throats you cut to pocket the rubbing, sore you slut to cop some sleep. Bash a face for bleeding tuppence, pure disgrace to work so cheap. Why I say, don't be a sinner for the price of London gin. You can't pay for one square dinner with the wages of sin. So we so <laughs> go love, come off it. Who would buy this sack of skin on the whole? There ain't much profit. What little slice of raspberry tart. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss, I'm sure. First time in the town with him, is it, eh? Never you feel love. I've been with him on numerous occasions, and whatever he's got in store for you, praise God it'll be over within an instant. <laughs> What do they pay you, love? By the note? <laughs> I've seen girls from gutter families trap rich men with flottery ways. And they coo coo past the jam, please, over nuptial breakfast trays. Over there in bed eleven sleeps a bleeding hypocrite. Spends his day. Eyes cast to heaven, spends his nights amongst this shit. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I do beg your pardon. I didn't mean to. That, that won't happen again. I promise. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, shit. That's why I say, don't take half measures, do things right and dig right in. In this world, there's greater treasures than the wages of sin. I get threats, but seldom offers. If I did, I'd pack them in. You can't fail too many covers with the wages of sin. Give your old love some help with the last line, then. With the wages of sin. Oh, bloody hell. You could do better than that. Get off your bum, 
bums and give us the notes. Get off your bums and give us the notes. I'm serious. I don't see you all standing. Oh, it's getting better. Still something new. Oh, yes, that's it. Lovely. All right. Mr. Purcell, you may be guest. The meanest room in London. And would not the parishioners of Cloisterham Cathedral be astounded to see in bed 11 that goodly choir master of Cloisterham Cathedral, Mr. John Jackson? Woman! I need more laudanum than wine. And quickly! My task is only half finished, and your medicine is less than potent than usual. Laudanum? So, you're mixing opium with the wine these days, huh? I'll fix it for you. Good, good. And quickly, before I get to the great colors of the great landscapes, I must be rid of him. Who? Him! Him! God spare you. There's nobody Oh my there. God, there he goes! There he goes! There he is! There I am. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, be still and have yourself a pleasant journey. seem to recall what I said. Could you show me to the nearest railway station? I seem to be lost. Five and threepence, you owe me. Five and threepence? It seems a very large sum for a very small courtesy, however, if you are that needy. The nearest station is in Aldgate, three minutes of a walk away from the river. Thank you. Incredible. Who are you then? And what are you? I wonder how many of you noticed that meaningful statement. That sounded suspiciously like a clue to me. May we have it again, please? Angela, you can all stay seated for this one. <laughs> Who are you then? And what are you? 
What, indeed? But now, as we return to less sordid surroundings, we meet Cloisterham's leading citizen, Mayor Thomas Sapsey. Good afternoon, Mayor Sapsey. Hmm. Really? With a sack of what? But that's just unacceptable, isn't it? Once again, you'll see who gets saddled with the... Ladies and gentlemen, your kind indulgence for a short announcement. The part of Mayor Sapsey will not, I repeat, will not be portrayed this evening by Mr. James Hitchens as is stated in your program. You see, as many of you already know, Mr. Hitchens has tended to appear more frequently at the bar in the rear than up here in front of the footlights. And so it will come as no surprise to our regulars that Mr. Hitchens is once again massively indisposed due to injuries he received while fighting for a lady's honor. Apparently, the lady wished to keep it. <laughs> and so, the part of Mayor Sapsey will be taken this evening by your own humble chairman and obedient servant. I refer to, of course, ladies and gentlemen, myself, Mr. William Cartwright. I hope this last-minute substitution is met with your approval. <laughs> and might I add, it's more your luck than mine. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor Sapsey. Good afternoon, Reverend Chris Sparkle, and, um... Oh, these are my twin charges from Ceylon, Mayor Sapsey. I'm taking them to meet... Oh, and in fact, here he comes now. Helena Neville, allow me to introduce young Edwin Drood. Sir. Sir, I congratulate you on your good fortune, sir. Good fortune, sir. Your betrothal, sir? Oh, yes, yes, Rosa. Our young Ned is soon to depart himself towards your side of the globe, Neville. Ceylon, Mr. Drew. No, but much the same. Egypt. To make your future there, sir? No, but to ensure that Egypt has one. I shall shortly be taking over my family's engineering concern there, and I do intend to pull off a miracle. Pray, what miracle? Cairo transverse, Mr. Landless. A thoroughfare of commerce and coach travel across the desert to Alexandria. A monumental task, Mr. Drew. Yes. One wonders from where one will obtain, for example, the paving stones? From the pyramids. No! Yes! My studies show that there is enough rock in the top half of the Great Pyramid alone. This is English blasphemy! Is it not enough that you take out delicate brewed tea leaves and likewise improve it by boring cows? No! Please! There's no reason to raise our voices here in... What? Pardon? Cloisterham High Street. Oh, thank you. Cloisterham High Street. I meant no offense, sir. And I did not mean for my awkward ways to arouse your splendid feathers, Miss Bob. I'm sure Mr. Landless only feels passionately about his part of the world, Edwin. As long as he can keep his passions in check. I fear I have not yet adjusted to your restrained climate. As of yet, Master Edwin, Ms. Bard. My uncle is already giving me some account of your hot-blooded temperament and past, sir. Let's hope you can keep them both behind you. My reputation precedes me here. A situation I need most fear. What hope have I of blending in with this my shade of skin? I thought I'd clean my slate at last, but they anticipate my past. What shall I show them before fit? What do I owe them for what they expect? A major subject on display, in from Ceylon today. I am a Galatian, to this location, has brought our station down the Divide creation, Eric and Byron, and the English are they, and the British, British am I. British are they, and the English am I. There are two subjects we don't discuss. One is our monarch, the other's us. And yet I fear you soon will be a subject of scrutiny. A British subject, nonetheless. Burma. 
What's all the fuss? All the Burma belongs to us. A British subject bred born and subject not to scorn. I am a British or my British or Jewish destiny. As plastic rappers, we nod to my journal. The insulation of the population is the explanation. I am British, am I? It is just as I've been saying. There is an instinctive rivalry between my own dear boy and this landless fellow. I fear his hot blood and eastern temperament. You seem to exaggerate. I will go mad! Do you not realize that there is more than one side to more than one things in nature? Beneath Neville's tainted English accent and adopted English manners, there is a heathen landless, a tribesman landless, a hot blooded, hot caste, hot bred, who will kill as easily as he will curb his sleek hair. Come, come, Mr. Jasper, this is quite. To the contrary! I myself suffer from this duality on occasion. Sometimes I will forget things, and in going back to find them, I find myself rounding the corner of our return. And what about me having to play your chairman and this mayor sapsy bloke at the same time? It's damn confusing. Ah, much like I'll never land this fellow. I find that. I am not myself these days, for all I know I might be you. There's more than room enough for two inside my mind. I am likewise in a haze of who I am from scene to scene. What's more, we two, we four, I mean not in a mind. For is it I or is it me? And if I'm him and if I'm he, each one of us might not agree on what to do. And if I take opposing sides within myself, then who defines of what is right or wrong? Hippity, boppity, toppity, droppity, twelve to a shilling, twice after a barn, and which an offense the currency bar, and the final and safe physical sides of the coin. Bobbish or ochre from pennies to Guinness, the two sided misses, the rule not exception, and which should not feel quite the fool of deception, the final and safe physical sides of the coin. Odds or even, heads or tits, it's high or low, or black or white, it's up or down, or left or right, or night, or day. Nature seldom ever fails to most obligingly provide an undisclosed opposing side to one's dismay. There's shadows in this shining morn. If there's a rose, if there's a thorn. We're good as dead as soon as born, and yet we smile. The life's provision is perverse. It seems to work more in reverse. If things are better, they'll be worse in just a while. Hippity whoppity toppity toppity twelve to a shilling twice after a florin and would you not fancy the currency far in the final and faceable sides of the coin? Barbers are hunger for pennies to give us the two sided measures the rule not exception and would you not find me the fool deception the final and faceable sides of the coin? Hippity whoppity toppity twelve to a shilling twice after a florin and would you not fancy the currency far in the final and faceable sides of the coin? Barbers are hunger for pennies to give us the two sided measures the rule not exception and would you not find the fool deception the final and faceable sides of the coin? Mr. Jasper, I shall certainly keep my eyes out for this Neville Landless fellow. A very good and original idea, Mayor Sapsy. However, if you will excuse me, I must change. Bye bye. And now we must step out from Cloisterham High Street and fall in step with a specimen known only to the citizens of Cloisterham as Durgles. A man whose knowledge of the cathedral tombs is exceeded only by his capacity for wine and spirits. 
He is wending his way towards an important assignation. What's that you say, Bill? I said an assignation with Mayor Sapsi, who lives just around behind. What's that you say, Bill? I said around behind. So have you! <laughs> I didn't come here to be insulted. Oh, why? Where do you usually go? I'm not a complete fool, you know. Oh, which bit is missing? You're next to an idiot. Why is it you? Ladies and gentlemen, essaying the role of Dirtles, I give you the clown of the music hall royale. Your friend, not mine. I give you an I do not want her back, Miss Patsy Cricker. Assistant to your friends by my own lad, young Patsy Cricker the second. Yes, another round of applause for Patsy Cricker and Junior. Afternoon, Mayor Saxe, your lordship, sir. Good afternoon, Dirtles. <laughs> Begging your pardon, sir, the cough, it's a touch of a uh, tombatism. No, you mean rheumatism. No, sir, I've been working on your dead wife's grave. <laughs> Please refer to the late Miss Thomas Sapsey as just that, Turtles, the late Miss Thomas Sapsey. That is how I like to think of her, <laughs> at least, that is how I wish to keep her. She was a uh, one in a million. No, one in a raffle. <laughs> but is my wife's tomb ready? Yes, Governor, the door is all ready for my inscribing. And I shall be much happier when we've moved her from her temporary grave, though it's not been at all damp. The moles would have been able to get at her for ages. But there's nothing much she can do but the worms. I mean, they've already made a meal out of Miss Sapsey. Turtles? And who is this thing, this boy? My protege, squire, name of deputy. I put the lock on your wife's crypt myself, your lordship. That's right, and I have the keys right here. And it'll be my pleasure to unlock that door and slide your old woman in there tomorrow. There's enough room for the entire royal families of afternoon tea. Yes, yes. That crypt is a national treasure, if I may make so bold, your, your grace. In fact, just a while ago, Mr. Jasper asked me if I could take him to the crypts to see it. You might like to add that line to your list of suspicious statements. <laughs> Steady on, Bill. We don't want these people leaping to conclusions without all the facts at hand. Otherwise, they'll all be running. Off to the races! No, no, no! Stop, stop! Right, let's have a chorus of off to the races! Shut up! That's scheduled for later on in the program. We mustn't slow the dramatic momentum we're building here. For now we must... Off to the races! Shut up! For now we must step into the darkness. In hopes of shedding new light upon our curious story, we follow Dirtles and Deputy Two, the graveyard of Cloisterham Cathedral. Turtles? Turtles! Mr. Jasper! Bloody hell! Have you been watching me this entire time? I'll have the blood of you! <laughs> <laughs> That'll serve you. You murdered him! What did you say? Murder! Murder! Turtles! We stop talking such lunacy and help me revive the dear boy! I only pray that. Time, so help me. Quiet, young wretch. Deputy, why have you assaulted me this way? You write for the asylum, Mr. Jasper. Peculiar, lad. 
Blame it on his uh, infectious youth, sir. But oh, that was excellent wine you gave me last night, more potent than I'm accustomed to. Did you get to look inside Miss Safsi's crypt while I was asleep? Uh, no, I seem to have gotten lost. Well, I was lost myself in a fitful dream, Mr. Jasper. I dreamt that someone had uh, touched me and taken something from me. Ah! And here's what it was. Mayor Safsi wouldn't like me leaving the keys to the mausoleum lying around. He gave me strict instructions that the keys were... Well... Now the key to Miss Sapsi's tomb is missing. What do you think, Mr. Jasper? <laughs> I think I have guests to at any moment for Christmas dinner, and a poor host I would be not to give them all the comfort and the joy of the season. Merry Christmas, Turtles. God rest ye merry, Mr. John Jasper. <laughs> Many a bright and chatting afternoons among these silent tombs, my beloved. But no, we are not legally bound to marriage. Then, Eddie dearest, let us change to brother and sister from this day forth. Never to be husband and wife? Never. I'm honor bound to confess that this thought does not originate with you alone, Rosa. I know, dear one. You have not been truly happy with our engagement, nor have I. Sorry, Rosa. And I for you, poor boy. If only our marriage had not been assured since birth then maybe we would truly know how we feel towards each other. If we were perfect strangers, how perfect life could be. Change of plans from Mr. Jasper for a while, Eddie? 
course you're right. Why give him such sad news on Christmas Eve? Now we must be off. We're late. And I fear there's a storm brewing. We have here in Cloisterum. First snow, and now this raging storm. The gods must be angry. God must be angry, Neville, not gods. We use the singular here in England. What a storm for Christmas Eve. Oh, yes. Twas like this the night that Rose's mother died. Neville tells me you're once engaged to Rose's mother, Mr. Crisparkle. Oh, yes. But I fear I was a bit too Anglican for her taste. A bit too angular. But then. One night, at a seaside party celebrating her second anniversary, only a few months after Rosa was born, she apparently slipped and fell while walking unobserved along the cliffs, and fell into the cold embrace of the cold, ungrateful waves. But enough of that! <laughs> Let us follow Mr. Jasper's lead over and forget our grievances with each other in life over a nice, sturdy Christmas dinner. I hope you will forgive the meager merits of my humble table. Hello, all. Sorry we're late. We fought the storm all the way through. Mr. Bard, how wondrous it is to see you again. May I take your things? I had no idea you were taking on domestic staff, Uncle. Edwin, Mr. Lampus will take you seriously. No fear of that. Now, lads. Rosa, you have no idea what it means to have you in my chambers. Miss Bud, how is it that in a season of holly you remind me of the flowering hibiscus? And how is it, Mr. Landis, that you remind me of an inconsistent baker? For while your metaphors are uncommonly stale, your matters are uncommonly fresh. You go too far, sir. Gentlemen! This is Christmas Eve, and I will have no more unchristian-like behavior from both of you. Now then, this mulled wine is very good stuff indeed. I recently obtained a recipe for it on a recent trip to London. Any port in a storm for me, Uncle? Ha! Ha! I get it! Any port in a storm! Very good one, Edwin. <laughs> uh, oh, none for me, thanks. Let us drink deep. This wine is more potent than usual, Jack. Well, I knew you lads would like it. Now, no more ill will between you. Please, Edwin. There is no more any need for rivalry between us, Mr. Landless. You have my friendship, if you wish it. And a Merry Christmas to you too, Edwin. The goose is cooked. <laughs> Miss Bud, I believe your next Christmas will be in Egypt. My God, Landless! Why don't you join Rose and I? Of course, we could use somebody to carry our bags. What? Someone more acquainted with the foreign tongue than he is with minding his own. Ladies, gentlemen, let us be seated. Sir, I don't much like your tone. That supercilious sneer you wear. Clear you wear a finer coat than mine. A butter waistcoat worn can soon be torn in faggots too till maggots feed on you. Something in this speech seems ominous to me. Pray promises to me. Praise to him nearby, and for this we should be glad. Won't you try some wine? No, the can come from bed. My dearest Ned, I wish to wish you well. The world is yours before you, just like oysters on the shell. Lalas says you are known, your blood is hot, but less than pure, less I'm sure than we your history. Would indicate the cast of some has cast runs through your veins. Your cronus thus explains something sets a chill like fate upon my grave. Can my strength and will completely never save? Could these words they say bring harm upon the land? I must follow day. No good can come from bad. My dynasty. 
deepest friends. May I propose a toast to Rosa Bond and Edwin Drew. Three cheers. And here's the roast. How very blessed are we when oh so many star. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Which one of you will come? Galantis cut like lid, their bow with daggers drawn. I glare at you, there at you, damn the strong to stare at whom I make my wife and cheer my life. I see you dead before she rose away. Fate waits near, I feel it, I fear it. We are friends, and yet they'll not soon forget. Hearing Neville's threat, every epithet. In younger days, I hungered for another. Rosa's mother. After Rosa's birth, she let this start down. Dust is all I'm worth. So long a time, they thought that I'm a Jensen or quite naive. But I perceive these boys, this noise, more for I think that they might conceive. I shall go with you on your walk. And we must return to the nun's house before the storm. Good night, Edwin. My dear. Everyone. Rosa. Be careful how you tread, Neville. And I shall see the ladies safely home. Will you be joining us, Uncle? No, I'm afraid I have some unfinished business. However, I will not let you go out in that flimsy coat. You shall borrow my humble but serviceable caped coat. Come, Edwin. Your destiny awaits. Goodbye, Uncle. Goodbye, all! When shall these three meet again? When, if ever? It is now the next day, Christmas Day to be exact. The storm is gone, but in its wake there is to be found no trace of young Edwin. Until my assistant Bazard reports. You've heard the sentiment voice, I'm sure, that no news is most certainly good news. And in fact, here he comes now. Bazard, what news? No news. There, you see. I don't think you've met my assistant Bazard. His chief occupation is guiding excursion parties around our church. Quite the showman is our Bazard, but tragically misplaced. Misplaced? Yes, Rosa. Bazard carries with him a terrible secret. Now, Rosa, what do you think Mr. Bazard has done? Oh dear, nothing dreadful, I hope. Mr. Bazard has written a play, a tragedy, The Thorn of Anxiety. When will it be performed, Mr. Bazard? Never. I think our Bazard has more confidence in its lack of support, like a citizen of Greece who prefers the Parthenon in ruin. But I shall hope to see his work performed someday. I too, Mr. Bazard. I love the theatrical world, but there are many stages beyond the proscenium. I long to play a larger part. <laughs> well then, Bazard, use your enviable creativity to find some accounting for our young Ned. That assignment I eagerly accept. Oh, my dear hopeless Edwin. How like her mother she looks. Had the Lord seen fit to smile on me, had her mother not married another, nor met her death two years later at that pleasure party by the sea, I might have been Rosa's... Father! I need your prayers. Rise, my child. The cathedral bell summons us. And is it not significant, Mayor Sapsey, that Nevelandis was just seen fleeing the district? You've convinced me, Mr. Jasper, a secret murderer may be hiding in Cloisterham's most affectionate bosom. And all signs do point to Nevelandis. My thoughts exactly, sir. I shall instruct a few strong men to bring him here, using whatever voice is necessary so that we may question him. You do that, sir. 
Jasper, look what I've discovered. Why, it's my caped coat, the one I gave to Edmund last night. It's been torn to shreds, and there's blood on it. <laughs> Good God, where did you find this? Under a rock by the river Weir. My dear boy's been murdered. I take this oath before you, Bazard. Record it in your memory. <laughs> that I shall fasten the crime of murder upon this murderer. And I shall devote myself to his destruction. I shall remember your words, Mr. John Jasper. <laughs> and I believe that's it for you this evening, Philip. That's right, Bill. You know, it hardly seems worth it for you to come all the way down from Knutsford each night. You seem to specialize in these narrow parts of late. Not by choice, Mr. Cartwright. Let's see, in Julius Caesar you played the part of, um... A senator. Ah, so at least you are in it for the kill. You know, now that I think of it, it's rather odd that Mr. Charles Dickens included your character at all. Unless, of course, he had a more promising future in mind for you. That's been my solace in the role, Mr. Cartwright. Still, you do understudy Mr. Paget, as John Jasper, I note. Surely one of these days he- In actuality, Mr. Paget claims to have never missed a performance in his entire career. Ah, oh, well, Philip. Our run, our first act is almost over, and our second is considerably shorter in length than the first. Would you, do you perchance have a song ready at hand to why not indeed, I guess. <laughs> well, as a matter of happenstance, Mr. Cartwright, I do have, in common with my role this evening, aspirations as an author, and have composed a brief song, which I venture to say underscores the dilemma I share with the character of Bezard I portray. Come, come, it's title, Mr. Bax. What? Oh, uh, never the luck, Mr. Cartwright. Ladies and gentlemen, an unscheduled diversion in our journey this evening. The debut performance of an unpublished and perhaps rightfully unheard composition, Mr. Philip Back singing his own Never the Luck. Though ever I plan 
And ever I plot with ever the pluck to try. I wait for my star by fate to be struck, but never the luck. What have I done? Nothing, lad, I'm certain. I'm sure that there is some... Atlas, where is Edward Drood? Drood? Why do you ask me like that? Because you're the last person in his company and he is nowhere to be found. Mayor Satsi, do you wish to question the lad? You left for the river with Edward Drood at what time? In all honesty, I do not recall anything of what transpired between Edward and I once we reached the river. And what do you have to say about those bloodstains? I acquired those... these bloodstains, sir, just now, when these men of yours dragged me forcibly from the countryside where I had been walking. Neville Landless, as acting constable for the district, I place you under arrest. Neville! How many of them did it take to mar you in this way? Eight. You have an interesting way with the law here in Cloister, Mr. Sapsey. And you, Mr. Jasper, for days now you have been warning all of Cloister of impending violence between your nephew and my brother. What do you have to say of all this? Only that my nephew is dead. Mayor Sapsey, I warrant that, he mas that young Neville has no knowledge of Master Drew beyond which he has freely volunteered. And you shall volunteer nothing further, Neville. May I remind you and your brother that there is the issue of murder at hand. Before you utter that word again, you laughable man, perhaps you'll be good enough to supply a body, a victim, a corpse, something more tangible than an errant nephew, a timorous uncle, and a ludicrous city official who has no backing for his charges beyond pure pop and sheer circumstance. Here, here. Well said, Helena. You know, she's right, Mayor Sapsey. Without Master Edwin's body, you cannot possibly arrest young Neville. Oh, very well, release him. Oh, bless you, Mr. Chris Barkle. <coughs> I'm overpaid. Yes, well, let's all pause for a moment here, shall we? Edwin Drood is now gone and may likely be Clive dead. John Jasper has sworn vengeance upon his nephew's murderer. Whom well, most of this populace suspect to be Neville Atlas. But the charges have been rescinded thanks to Helena's steely resolve and the kindly. Reverend Mr. Crisparkle, who was once engaged to. Rosa's deceased mother. Meanwhile, it's difficult to know what what should make of. The drunkard stonesman Dirtles and his young apprentice deputy. Not to mention the mysteriously motivated purveyor of opium, the Princess Puffer. Statements to consider during the interval with one admonition. Should you find yourself leaping to conclusions without all the relevant facts at hand, you may find yourself carried off to the races. A spontaneous request, which brings us rather adroitly, I think, to a song. For what would an evening at the Music Hall Royale be without a rendition of its trademark anthem, Off to the Races? Conclusions often lead the best of us astray. No wiser's move in life is just to wait. Otherwise, you're galloping emotions round the way like horses at the gates. Off to the races, off to the races, off to the race we go. But where the chase is and what the pace is, we seldom seem to. Kids to date, you wonder how Prince Albert got enthused. For a 
probably by perjury he had to procreate, said she, make me amused. Out to the races, the royal races, the same as poor folk do. When she embraces, yes. the royal graces, what? the same in wants as you.